This is a story of greed and gold. The quest for a mysterious treasure called Yamashita's gold, named after the legendary Japanese general who made his last stand in the mountains of the northern Philippines as the Second World War drew to a close. The story goes that before his defeat, Yamashita ordered his troops to bury a fortune in gold that the Imperial Army had looted from Asia. Some say it was the largest treasure hoard in history. Japan had amassed huge quantities of treasure, far in excess of anything that the Third Reich assembled during World War II. No witnesses were supposed to be left alive to reveal where the treasure was buried. But one Filipino claims to have lived to tell the tale. There are so many soldiers inside. They're drinking wine, sake, bansai, bansai, bansai. When we were inside the tunnel, when we go out, I hear a boom, boom, boom. For treasure hunters, Yamashita's gold represents the ultimate dream of fabulous wealth. From the early 1930s onwards, Japanese forces marched through Asia, spreading down from Manchuria, through China to Southeast Asia, and on to the archipelagos of the Southern Pacific. Japan itself possessed few resources. With an army of over two million men to support, they needed plunder of all kinds to sustain their expansionism, food, raw materials, and treasure. And Asia was a storehouse of riches. For thousands of years, gold had been the currency of power and the symbol of splendor. Hunters for Yamashita's gold say that vast amounts of this Asian loot were buried in the Philippines. They say they have the evidence to prove it. Coded maps of Japanese treasure sites. Gold bars and artifacts discovered across the islands. Thirty years ago, one Filipino treasure hunter said he'd unearthed a solid gold Buddha, part of Yamashita's private stash. In the 1990s, this Buddha was the subject of a major court case, resulting in a $22 billion judgment, one of the largest in legal history. Many of the people that go treasure hunting in the Philippines know perfectly well that the story is true. There are those that are, uh, imagine that the Yamashita's treasure is a glorious legend and it's fun and wouldn't it be fun to go do this? But there are others that know perfectly well that gold has been recovered there, large quantities of gold. In the 1930s, Japan was facing a severe economic uh, downturn. So there was a growing sense in Japan that unless they expanded militarily, that they would be facing the prospect of not only mass unemployment, but perhaps even starvation. So they began to look towards China as the solution to their problems. In 1931, Japan seized the province of Manchuria and began stripping it of resources. Six years later, imperial troops attacked the nationalist capital of Nanking, slaughtering tens, some say hundreds of thousands of civilians in a massacre that became known as the Rape of Nanking. 
reports of Japanese brutality shocked the world. Yet the scale of Japanese looting received far less attention. When I was researching my book, I came across literally hundreds of references of Japanese looting in the city, in wartime diaries, um, in missionary accounts. There were stories of the Japanese uh, breaking into embassies, churches, uh, schools, uh, banks, and systematically plundering whatever they found there. One of those who witnessed Japanese behavior at the time was an American academic, a history professor at Nanking University. Practically every building in the city was entered many, many times by roving gangs of soldiers throughout the first six or seven weeks of the occupation. In some cases, the looting was well organized and systematic, using fleets of army trucks under the direction of officers. The vaults in the banks, including the personal safe deposit boxes of German officials and residents, were cut open with acetylene torches. The pattern was repeated again and again over the years as the Japanese advanced. Philip Olenschlager recalls what happened at his father's bank in the Dutch East Indies when the Japanese arrived. Now, when the Japanese uh, had invaded Malaysia and Malaysia had fallen, then the bank, which had a headquarters in, in Batavia, which is now Jakarta, moved the gold reserves to the more central bank location of Bandung. Bandung is the central part of West Java. So all the gold reserves of the then colonial bank of Indonesia, called the Javasa Bank, were all in the folds of the bank in Bandung. And my father was one of the directors at the bank. And there the Japanese did put their hands on the gold in the folds. That gold was left in the folds and was taken by the Japanese. But also in the folds where all the private property, jewels, some gold, I guess, but mainly jewels of the people living in the Bandung area and also some which had come from Batavia. And bear in mind that Bandung was the center of the textile industry in all of Asia at the time. So there were very rich, mainly Chinese people there who had put all their, their property and jewels in the folds in the bank in, uh, in, in Bandung. And that was taken by the Japanese. So it was very definitely a concerted effort to, to, to rob the country. The looting was widespread and systematic, and it wasn't just perpetrated by the military. In some cases, it was carried out in collaboration with Japanese gangsters, the Yakuza. One of the key figures involved in this looting was Yoshio Kodama, a right-wing ultranationalist with links to the Yakuza. Kadama was given special military status in order to assist the imperial forces in acquiring war plunder. Kodama turns up in Shanghai and begins a series of activities that would make him one of the most powerful men in Japan. Kodama founds a, a, an agency called Kodama Kikan, literally the Kodama Agency, and it has an exclusive contract to buy strategic materials for the Japanese Navy's Air Force. Uh, well, uh, this gives Kodama an open license at gunpoint to take strategic materials from all corners of China. Uh, U.S. intelligence believed that, that his assets were worth some $175 million U.S. by the end of the war. Now bear in mind, this is in 1945, $175 million, this is a fortune. Kodama sees this in his writings as an idealistic enterprise to, to help to do his part for the war effort. Others might charitably call it looting. Millions of dollars worth of precious metals were seized by men like Kodama, ready to be shipped back to Japan. But just how much treasure did the Japanese take? And what happened to it? American author Sterling Seagrave believes that thousands of tons of gold were buried in secret sites across the Philippines, and that the whole operation, codenamed Golden Lily, was masterminded by the Japanese imperial family, including the emperor. 
regardless of the consequences of Japan's military actions on the mainland, the imperial family wanted to be absolutely certain that they were enriched and that Japan was enriched. It was the economic side of the military campaign. We know that there were 175 imperial treasure sites, and these sites have marked on them the quantity of gold that was hidden in each vault. They had hidden $100 billion, $1945 worth of treasure in the Philippines. Japan needed vast resources to continue its war. By the eve of World War II, half the country's gold reserves had been spent. The logic of their own expansionism drove the Japanese to one last throw of the dice. A great triumph that turned into an even greater disaster. December the 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. But less than six months after Pearl Harbor, Japan lost the Battle of Midway and control of the Pacific. The way the Yamashita Gold story tells it, the Japanese, their treasure ships now threatened, turned to a new harbor. During Japan's march across Asia, war plunder was seized and shipped home. After 1941, much of that loot, it's thought, traveled via the Philippines, the key staging post for ocean-going vessels en route from conquered Southeast Asia to Japan. For supporters of the Yamashita's gold story, the trail leads to the Philippines because of its pivotal position within the orbit of Japanese conquest. They used Manila as a staging area because this was one of the principal command posts. In Manila, they would offload the cargo so that the same ships could go back and continue to transport stuff from Singapore or Java, wherever, up to Manila. And then they would load the treasure certain of the more desirable treasure onto Japanese ships that were returning to Japan either for repairs, if they were military vessels, or in the case of cargo ships, they would come down loaded with material and then they would go back loaded with treasure. No one knows how much war loot reached Japan. By the end of 1942, American naval forces were taking control of the sea routes to the home islands. That made it uh, a ticklish situation for the Japanese because the war was turning against them. They recognized, many of them recognized, that they would lose the war militarily. And they had all this treasure sitting in warehouses in the Philippines. What were they going to do with it? If they couldn't ship it further north, they had to hide it. And they went to extraordinary lengths. They began this by using the old Spanish ruins and the old Spanish cathedrals in the Philippines, the ruins being some of the old forts. The cathedrals were well maintained, but underneath them they often had catacombs, which were ready-made places to stash gold bullion. The Japanese were facing a desperate final battle for the Philippines. They brought in the so-called Tiger of Malaya, General Tomoyuki Yamashita, who had captured Singapore early in the war. Again, no one knows how much Japanese treasure was buried, but one extraordinary eyewitness does confirm that some was. Minoru Sato was a young Japanese officer serving in the Philippines during World War II. As the war drew to a close, he was ordered to transport several boxes to a remote location. The military police headquarters in Manila contacted my unit as the war reached a critical stage. I took one of my men and went to headquarters in a truck. 
There we were given charge of a box of machine gun ammunition and two other boxes. So we took the two boxes on our backs and set off up into the mountains. Eventually we came to a cave. We thought this was the ideal place to hide the boxes. But I was curious to know what was inside. So I used my bayonet to break open the lid. We were surprised to find the box was not full of material necessary for the war effort. It was packed to the very brim with jewellery and there was a small crown of pure gold. Then we opened the other box. When I pulled back the top, I saw it contained gold bars. They weren't very big. I didn't check their weight, but they were about this thick. Ben Valmores is a key source, whose eyewitness account, if true, confirms one version of the Yamashita's gold story. According to this version, the Japanese imperial family took charge of the Asian loot. They worked through a top-secret organization called Golden Lily, and towards the end of the war, they buried billions of dollars worth of gold at 175 sites across the Philippines. At the time, Valmores was a teenager in the northern Philippines. He states that a young Japanese man he knew as Kimsu Marakusi took him on as his personal valet. He further says that Kimsu was in charge of the treasure burials and that he was a relative of the Emperor Hirohito. Kim Su came to us and then says, me, says, me, Hirohito, like that. But who exactly was Valmore's mysterious Kim Su? We discovered that um, Ben's prince was named Prince Takeda Suniyoshi. He was a first cousin of Emperor Hirohito and a grandson of the Meiji Emperor. A very handsome, debonair, well-educated man in his 30s. He came to the Philippines and effectively was put in charge of hiding all the treasure out in the countryside while Prince Chichibu was supervising sites in and around Manila. And it was Prince Takeda that Ben accompanied during the inventories. Ben is the only one who was present with the princes throughout much of the war and who actually went to all 175 imperial sites. This adds that before his departure, the prince, fearing he might die at sea, left him some personal possessions, including maps to all the imperial sites. Valmores says he was supposed to look after these until the return of the prince or one of his representatives. Uh, we are to separate already. So I'll get my uniform that I leave it to you and my sword, give it to you and then keep it. I will come back and get it. And then he says to me, well, Benjamin, he says, I see his eyes already that's becoming red and there is already water coming out. And then says, sayonara. Valmores is said to have picked out his prints from a lineup of photographs in a specially prepared test. He instantly identified Prince Takeda. And in fact, it stopped him cold. He hadn't seen the prince since 1945, so half a century had passed, and he was so moved, the tears came in his eyes, and he immediately began crooning Sakura Sakura, which is a Japanese folk song of cherry blossoms, which he said Takeda used to sing all the time. By the summer of 1944, it was clear to the Japanese that an American invasion of the Philippines was imminent. They prepared to make a last stand.
the general in charge of the islands was relieved and replaced by one of Japan's most successful wartime soldiers, General Tomoyuki Yamashita. Once the Americans landed, Yamashita withdrew from Manila to the mountains in the north, around the regional capital, Baggio. Eventually, in September 1945, Yamashita's forces surrendered. For some, the surrender opened the way for a conspiracy involving Yamashita's gold. These theorists argue that General Douglas MacArthur recovered a good deal of the gold in the Philippines and, along with American intelligence services and the Japanese royal family, spun a web of deceit that still obscures the truth today. One piece of evidence they rely on is the fact that almost as soon as General Yamashita surrendered, he was put on trial for war crimes, the first enemy commander in any theater of the Second World War to face such a charge. Accordingly, upon secret written ballot, two-thirds or more of the members concurring, the commission finds you guilty as charged and sentences you to death by hanging. The accused members of the defense staff, Japanese members of the defense staff, will be escorted from the courtroom. knowledge that U.S. forces were opening up some of the Imperial treasure sites. According to them, U.S. intelligence agents working for MacArthur had already learned of the existence of the gold during the long years of the Japanese occupation. The truth about all of this is that there was a hidden agenda. What was really going on was that MacArthur's men were at this very moment during the trial busily occupied recovering billions, hundreds perhaps, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of gold, and they knew that there were a great many more sites yet to be uncovered after that. So it's self-evident that the reason to get rid of Yamashita was to get rid of the man who would know that you had done this. <laughs> 